to speak personal about yourself and your previous lifestyle, if you've come away from that, it can turn out to be education to people to think, you know, because you got people out there to think, I can't do it. Yes, you can. Mm. I never dreamed of being an entrepreneur. In fact, my wife said to me, oh, you, why don't you become an entrepreneur? I didn't even know what entrepreneur meant. Real Talk with Star Scorpio Season 7. My guest today is the personification of faith, determination, and hard work. The road to success, however you determine it, is not easy. And I want to hear this man's journey today. Welcome, Emmanuel, because you also know I want to hear you about your hot sauce and how you turn it up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me, man. I really... I'm really grateful. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, happy to be a part of the show, man. Mm. Yeah. And letting people that let the people know that um, I'm going to let the people know that are watching or listening that I reached out to you because I like your vibe. I like what you stand for. You put God first. And um, I really appreciate what you're doing in 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 in, in, in Toronto and, and the surrounding areas with your hot sauce and um, preaching the faith. So. You know, Emmanuel, with Real Talk with Star Scorpio, we always um we, we always build a timeline. So first, let me know where were you born and raised. All right. So here's where the story begins. Mm -hmm. I was I was born in London, Ontario. Okay. Um, I I don't know how deep I want to get into, but I'm I'm gonna let I'm gonna let the people know like the real true background. So I between zero to five, I lived with my mom. Okay. From age five years old, I basically told my mom to F off, believe it or not. I went to live with my father thinking that life with my father would be better. Mm -hmm. um, between five and 10, I live with my father. But during that, that time frame, he had put me in 22 different foster homes and nine different schools. So that's what my life looked like living with my father at that time. Mm -hmm. um, there was a call made to my grandmother. And they basically said that if they didn't come and pick me up within 24 hours, that I would be put into permanent foster homes. So I was blessed. I came to Toronto mm -hmm. at age 10. So I'm going to be 50 August 7th. So I've never, honestly, bro, I didn't even know black people existed. Like I lived in the boondocks of, and I'm going to go deeper this. I, I lived in the boondocks of London, Ontario in Windsor. So I was on farmland. Mm -hmm. When I came to Toronto for the first time, my mom was dating a black guy. Mm -hmm. And his name was, actually, I'll, I'll leave the names out. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it, well, we're, we're going to talk about his brother now too as well. Okay. So I came to Toronto for the first time and my mom was dating a black guy. And between age 10 and 13, that's when I kind of became subjected to the, the urban environment. And that's how I came to know black people. Because like I said, I didn't know black people at all, bro. Wow. And my mom, my mom's ex-boyfriend, his brother is uh, Louis Robinson from Dream Warriors. And I, I mean, I rate this guy. I respect this guy. Mm -hmm. So we were always in Jane and Finch. And that's when the journey of learning how to speak Patoa came to life. So imagine from zero to 10... I only know English. I only know white folks. I only know hillbilly riding bike to school, riding yeah. bike, you know, to my friend's house. Yeah. Now I'm in the big city, you know, so I'm subjected to things I've never been subjected to before. Hip hop, R&B, reggae. Mm -hmm. And um, we were in Jane and Finch all the time. They used to call me Little Nettie. I don't mm -hmm. know why, <laughs> but I'm a little nitty. Yeah. And he would mock me all the time because I was a skinny little white dude. You know what I mean? With, with yeah. colored hair, blonde hair. And they would speak a lot of Pato around me. And I, it, it kind of frustrated me because I never really understood, understood it. What was, yeah, what was taking place. Yeah. Of course, like any language, we always learn the, the, the clots first. Yes. <laughs> I learned all the bad, the bad, um, you know, the bad words first. Yeah. By age 13, I was I was able to speak fluent Pato. But at that time, I was hanging around. I, my mom had moved me into... Um, it was uh, 1350 Danforth, so it wasn't too far from Foreigner McCallan. So I was a Scarberian. I, I grew up in basically in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, started to venture off into the, the you know, the urban environment and, and, and dealing with hip hop. And, and, of course, back in those days, in the 80s and the 90s, the violence wasn't the same. You know what I mean? People right. fought. You got beat up. You know, you, you never really got stomped. There might be a knife here. You know, the, 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 the lifestyle was different, but it was all new to me. So, of yeah. course, I embraced it. Having a stepfather that was of Jamaican descent, it was a big thing for me. So I'm trying to find myself between 10 and 13. Of course, I found myself in the in the Jamaican culture, and that, that became very much a part of who I was. But with that 
came a life of crime, came a life of womanizing, came, you know what I mean? Like I could speak such fluent, I can still speak Pato now, but I spoke so raw back then that all I had to do was say, yo, baby, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> Over. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah, I became yeah. like the celebrity white guy in the block because back in those days, unless you were a true Jamaican, mm -hmm. it wasn't really a lot of white folks speaking Pato like that. So there was, there was, there was like jealousy, there was envy, there was a lot of women who, you know, want to be a part of that. So I got myself involved in crime. So basically from 13 to 19 in Toronto, I, I pretty much hung out in almost every everywhere. I, I lived in Bay Mills for a period of time. Mm -hmm. I went to Stephen Leacock. Mm -hmm. I hung out in Markham and Eglinton. I hung out in Jane and Finch. I hung out in Parkdale. Um, I ventured through Eppleworth. Um, I went to Melbourne, Melbourne Court frequently. Back then, it, it, it just wasn't what it was today, right? You know, so mm -hmm. I was never a part of any gang or anything like that, but I lived the hood life, you know, robbing people, stealing, robbing from stores, you know, doing all that wannabe gangster stuff. Mm -hmm. But I never forgot the fact that I was white and there's a place for white folks. But I, the only thing I did forget was how to dress. I dressed crazy. I used to dress in some, some reggae roots outfits and some <laughs> red silk suits and ballet suits. They used to call me champion roots. Like I had the most clothes bro like i it, it was crazy i had gold teeth i had big link chains like i i was just out of place yeah so went through this whole transitional period of trying to find out who i'm who is this white guy you know what i mean i got a black stepfather i'm hanging around with black people my best friend was a black guy jamaican descent or he was from jamaica mm -hmm. learning how to speak patwa growing up in all these different hoods getting myself in trouble thinking that that's the right way you know, and, and it really made a lot of, it makes Jamaican people look bad. And I hate to say it because that's what my philosophy was yeah. in order to perpetrate or be like a Jamaican, you gotta be rough. You know, you gotta, you gotta portray this rough neck image. You gotta portray this gangster mentality. And that's really not what Jamaica's about because I've been there many a times and you'll go into the country, you'll go into Bush and I may be getting sidetracked here, but Jamaica is a very beautiful country. You know what I mean? Like anywhere there's good and bad. Right. Mm -hmm. But I just grew up lost in space lost in this world of not really understanding and comprehending that as much as i want to represent i was doing it the wrong way mm. as years came to pass uh, i've always been i guess you could say more west end at heart even though i lived in scarborough yeah. and i'm not gonna i'm not dogging anybody if anybody who says you know i have no no issue with scarborough versus east west you know i'm 50 years old now i don't i don't play that but it was a lot of beef between where i lived in Bay Mills and Dower and Jane and Finch. And I heard all the things because going to Jane and Finch every week, I came to know Finch guys and going, I won't use the terminology, but on Tuesday night, you used to call it end night. Yes. yes. So, you know, we would go out on that night mm. and you know, I, would, I would be with a whole heap of Scarborough guys. And then there would be a bunch of Jane and Finch guys and there would be a big conflict. And, and, and it's really weird because being a white guy and growing up in these, all these different hoods and, and hanging all these different places, you have to be versatile. You can't have no enemies and you can't really, gravitate to any one particular area because you're still white. You know what I mean? And as, yeah. as much as society, you know, there were some people that accepted me. There's a lot of people that didn't accept me. Mm -hmm. So for example, speaking Pato was, was, was a challenge for a lot of people to comprehend. Cause like, but you're white, you know, yeah. why are you speaking Pato? And I'm like, okay, but just because I'm white doesn't mean I don't, it's, it's like Chinese. It's like, you know, if I learn how to speak Italian. Mm -hmm. So it came to a point that my bridging was just like, just lie to them and tell them that your father's from Jamaica. It'll make your life easy. Yeah. So I started lying to people. Mm -hmm. Oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm Canadian born, but my father's Jamaican. That father's Nova Scotian. He's from Cape Britain, Nova Scotia. <laughs> but yeah. having to defend myself all the time. In fact, one of these, this tattoo here, mm -hmm. probably can't see it, but I put a summertime. I'm a neck. Mm -hmm. Because people used to come to me and be like, why are you speaking Patois? I'm like, why are you asking me why am I speaking Patois? If I was speaking French, or, or Chinese or anything else, you'd be intrigued. Yeah. But because we're living in such a world where it's just black and white, people will always question it. Even if you're a white guy from Jamaica, there's still people out there that just, just can't appreciate that. Yeah. We're not going to get into history and all of that stuff, but you know what I mean? It's, it's mm -hmm. like, it was very challenging for me growing up. And all I wanted to do was be accepted by society. Mm -hmm. And it was many that accepted me, but it was many that rejected me, including white folks. So I, I almost, at one point, became racist towards my own people because... They hated me more than than anybody else because you're a white guy in their eyes trying to be black right. and i really i'm just trying to be me because I, I found myself and this is what i what i gravitated to mm -hmm. and you know here i am 40 years later and i'm still the same person in terms of like 
the ability to speak Patois. You know, I'm married to a, a beautiful Jamaican uh, descent woman. Mm-hmm. I've now given myself, you know, given my life to God. And, you know, my last, um, my last charge, I spent nine months in Guelph Correctional. I've been in, I don't know if you know any of these places, but 311 Jarvis, Warndale Court, Toronto East Detention, Toronto West Detention, mm, wow. you know. And, and I'm not saying these things to tell you that I was some bad man. I was just a bad person doing bad things, mm-hmm. you know, because I never, I never carried a gun. Although there was, I was supposed to get my hands on one. And by the blessed of God, it never fell through. Because with my temperament back then, had I got a hold of that gun, because I was selling marijuana and all kind of different stuff, and I can understand how the youth nowadays they're they're carrying guns because you needed that to protect yourself. When you get to a certain level in the drug game, you 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 start drawing a lot of attention to yourself. Mm. And me, I was in the drug game, but it was minor. It was mainly just I was working in a in a rehearsal factory in a studio, so I was selling weed, but I was I was making a lot of money. Yeah. So my appearance. My attire, having a big Gucci link chain, having like Bali suits and everybody knew this stuff was over two bills. You're drawing a lot of attention to yourself. So then, of course, you know, now you want to be a gangster because now you feel like, you know, you dress like a gangster. You, you start acting like a gangster. Right. Mm-hmm. But I never I never ended up getting a hold of the gun. That I was supposed to get a hold of because I got put in jail and they didn't let me out this time. So I'm not going to go over all the charges and everything. But I've been, you know, like after having served nine months in in um, Guelph Correctional. And, and what's funny is that. I was like, oh, there you have some real hillbilly white dudes. Yeah. And these guys are farmer boys. Like, these are some big dudes, man. Yeah. So you had to make your ends. So for me, my ends was cooking food. I used to make fried rice. Okay. And so, you know, you, you keep the head man happy yeah. and you're blessed and you're, you're pretty much protected. And, you know, and, and jail is a different place. Jail, I mean, even when I was in the West Detention Center, for example, I was put on, um, I'll just give you one story. I was put on a, on a black range. Because the guards thought that by putting me on a black range, I was going to get my tail whooped. Mm-hmm. And that didn't end up happening. Oh, you wait, wait. Good. When you say black range, just yeah, for like people that pre- know, what I'm thinking is it's predominantly black, all black people. All black yeah. people in that part of it. So they would put me on that range hoping that I would get beat up. But I ended up knowing a dude from Tuxedo Court. And he was in control of that range at the time. Mm. So everything was blessed. Mm. So then when they found this out, oh, see, guards are very dangerous, man. They'll put you in bad places and get, bad things will happen to you. So they moved me to another range, which was a white range, and I got my ass, I got beat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they put a beating to me, bro, because again, you're this white guy in everybody's eyes trying to be black. Yeah. So it wasn't until I served the nine months and I came out that that's when I changed my life in terms of criminal minded. I wasn't about that life anymore. Mm-hmm. Luckily for me, I never got a hold of a gun. I never did anything gangster to that magnitude. I never killed nobody. I never got no, you know, like murder, attempt murder charges or whatever. So, you know, my life was was mediocre, you know what I mean? But I was still troubled from 13 to 19, being on the street, being in and out of jail, having been in foster homes, group homes, nine different schools. You know, I came out of school in grade 10. A lot of people don't know that. You know, I educated myself. I learned. I went back and and taught myself things. I and mean, now, you know, I recently became an entrepreneur. Um, you know, being being a womanizer, it's, it's, it's not a good thing, bro. But at the end of the day, you know, you're young and you're, you know, you're, you're, it's, it's too overwhelming. Yeah. You know, but all you got to do is say hello to a woman in Patwa and, 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 you know, two twos, you're connected. It's like, you know, it's, it's better than money. Yeah. <laughs> and it felt that way anyways. So now kind of fast forwarding to where I am now, I, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about like my wife, for example, like I met her, uh, we were working at a, um, at a TTC, um, uh, what do you call it? Like a TTC where they park the buses. Okay. And my job basically and her job was just to take the buses, move them into um, into a wash bay. They would wash them, oil it, uh, put oil in it, and then we would park it. And mm-hmm. she was the only black woman that was there. Mm-hmm. So here was this five foot 11, tall, beautiful black woman. And I'm just like, I, I, I was in love, like first love at first sight. Yeah. And I was trying to give myself back to God at that point, because it was a place where, I had fallen back so many times over the years. I've given my life to God, never, never doubted that God existed, but always a backslider could never really find my place, a permanent place. Mm -hmm. So when I found out that she was Christian, um, it gave us an opportunity to be able to read our Bibles together. And that's when the whole journey and now five years later really, you know, magnified per se, you know, because we rely on each other to keep one another's faith. Um, I'll tell you a story about God. If I'm going off, let me know. Like if I'm no, I, okay. I let me let me tell you something right now. 
Yeah. I've done you're my 70 70th podcast, right? Okay. And there's been a few. I I enjoyed all of them. But there's been a few where when someone starts talking, I like the direction it's going and I let you lead. And that's that's what I'm feeling with this podcast. Right. It happened right. with a hip hop artist named Wavy Spice One, another guy named Celebrity, and uh Kalman Samuels. He's a rabbi in Israel when I interviewed right. him. Right. And I'm feeling that with you. So okay. let it go. Let it I go. Don't feel like, yeah, I don't want to feel like, yeah, I don't want to disrespect or feel like I, it's, it's, you know, it's your show. No, when I <laughs> so have yes, questions. I want to be, I want to be respectful. Okay. No, when I have questions, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, but yeah, I'm liking where this is going. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to let, you know, people know where I came from and where, and where I am today mm-hmm. and, um, you know, went through a lot of struggles and, and basically trying to plant your foot in, in the spirit of God in, in, understanding and knowing God and your purpose in life is very, very challenging. Abiding the Bible, uh, and I'm not here to dispute anybody's beliefs. I can only tell you for myself what I believe in. So I'm not here to dispute religions or anything like that. I can only tell from my personal experience. But when you believe in God and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you take on a different nature. Your demeanor eventually comes to change. Your way how your mind thinks, the way how you process things. You have you have a sense of guilt. So, you know, for me, it, it was converting to listening to gospel music was never something I was, it was always pure dancehall, you know, like, you know? And, and I mean, I listen to dancehall now, but it can only be clean, but only periodically. I don't feed my, my spirit with that. Mm. Although I respect it, but it just, because even though it's clean, there's still a lot of lyrical content that is not, I, I couldn't go into a church, you know, with a little speaker box and we have that bumping in the background. It just, yeah, yeah. We, we just know it's not a, it's not of a clean spirit per se. Mm-hmm. So, me and my wife, um, you know, we started basically, well, she was already Christian and I was just coming back to, and, um, you know, we, we, we started to grow together and, and to learn and understand one another's indifferences and to grow in God and to grow in Christ. And um, so now where the hot sauce is concerned is um, I, I used to work as a DZ truck driver. So that was my job prior to what I'm doing now. Mm. And uh, I was also a bouncer. I was a bouncer for 22 years. So that's a whole that's a whole other podcast, but I can tell you. That I- wait, whoa, whoa, whoa! This is what I got to ask you, though, man. First of all, diesel. So you you got your DZ license? What is it? Which I got a I got a BZ license, BZ but I drove license. a DZ truck. Yeah, so okay. I, I drove the, the bus in the bus terminal where I met her. Mm-hmm. Uh, outside of that, I was working for a temp agency, the same agency I work for now. Okay. But I started doing deliveries because I didn't want to drive a bus, right? Because the, the the commitment to it was is crazy. The hours are crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So a BZ license is higher than a DZ. So you can drive a DZ vehicle, like a straight truck, 26 okay. foot air brakes. Yeah. So I wait, uh, wait. And then the bouncing, you wait, we're the same yeah. age. You're turning 50 in August. Yeah, I'm yeah. turning 50 in November. Okay. And I got to tell the people, so Bay Mills, <laughs> I live in the area right now. And you stepped in this area for a I, bit yeah. too in your life. So I used to live at 365. I, Oh, wow. So <laughs> I, it is crazy. So I feel like, I don't know in life if we bumped into each other somewhere because we used to do the club thing and I'm sure you did the club. Oh, thing. yeah. Oh, but 100%. one thing I want to ask, though, when you say bounce it, where do you remember where you bounce? Was it at the oh, club? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, I worked. I, I go back as far as um, I mean, when I first first started, I worked in Asian karaoke's. Oh, I believe really? I was, yeah, I was young. I was maybe in my early, like maybe what, in night to t- early 20s. Yeah, I worked in Asian karaoke's, and you don't really bounce in Asian karaoke's because those guys are mafia. Yeah. You just basically, you you're just there as a face, as a white face. Yeah. So you would work with an Asian guy who could understand their language, mm. and you would just pretty much just be there to make it look like you almost. They're almost trying to make it look like you're a cop or something. That's that's the yeah. concept that people will believe. But you're really just standing there and stamping people and checking IDs. But if a fight breaks out, believe me, you're not getting involved because that man's don't fight one on one. It's like fifty on fifty. Yeah, yeah. So it's out of control. Mm-hmm. Um, my very first urban nightclub was Static Nightclub down in Yorkville. <laughs> you worked at Static. Yeah, I used to work for Desi. I don't know if you know Desi, but I used no, to work for Desi. Yeah. So Desi was the owner. So that was my first urban nightclub, and that's when a lot of like I, I had to be I had to be that crazy white guy, five eight, stocky. Mm. All the brothers were well over six foot. Wow. So you rest assured I had to always throw down to let people know that I wasn't messing around. So mm. a lot of enemies. I worked at uh Red Square. I worked at Time Nightclub moving forward. I worked at um base a place called Base Nightclub. I did boat cruises. I worked for Wayne Warner. I worked on the strip on Richmond Strip. I worked at well, you uh, did. Um, yeah, I didn't do um I didn't do the famous one though. 
Okay. I can't remember the name, but there's one, there's one on, on Richmond that everybody was known for. My boy Kirk used to work there. Mm. Um, but there's a couple of ones on the Richmond strip that I like used to fluid, work. Like the fluids and down fluid, the street. Fluid, I didn't work. Fluid, okay. you had to be a certain physique. You had to be a certain look. You had to have like, you just had to have a certain persona and a certain type of look. Yeah. I didn't have, I was a short, stocky dude. They wanted a pretty boy, six foot, you know, the, the yeah. brother. Yeah. Um, but I worked at, um, Oh man, I worked at Mad Bar. I worked at there was another club that used to go downstairs, but I worked at a number of those other different clubs like there. What about Spectrum? On I think it was Danforth, man. Spectrum. No, I never did Spectrum. Yeah, I Spectrum. went there before. I yeah. I worked at Berlin's nightclub. That was pretty oh. popular back in the day. Yes, yes. I, I did a couple events at government, but really just working for the promoter, so the front door. So I never worked like in the actual club. Yeah. Um. I did a lot of boat cruises. I did a lot of reggae jams. I used to work at Level Nightclub. I used to work at, um, like I said, Time. There was another club on Richmond. A lot of these clubs have all changed over. Oh, I used yeah. to work at the old G Spot. That's, That's the club. one. That's the one oh, I forgot yeah. about. I used yeah. to work at G Spot. It, it went. It changed name from G Spot and two other names. I can't remember their names, but mm -hmm. that was probably. I used to work at Rockwood too, but between Rockwood and the old G Spot, yeah. those were the most. I mean, I'm talking crazy. I mean, I, I I put a guy down with a baton, caught a case, ended up beating the case because the guy was he was he was he came at me and I I, I laid him out first and then he came at me again shortly after. Yes. So I did I bent my baton on him. Um <laughs> Rockwood, I, I can't even tell you how many people I floored, man. Like I it was just it was I was so bad tempered back then. Mm -hmm. And it, it was nuts. The uh G spot, those guys were far more temperamental than me. Yeah, we used to work at G Spot. Yeah, like twenty five security. You touch one, you touch all. Yeah, like, that place was just crazy. Yeah, um, that was that was absolute madness. Uh, level was pretty crazy too. I've been bottled a couple times. I've had guys rush me. Mm -hmm. I mean, you name it. Like I've I've seen guys beat down. I used to work at the docks uh, when they oh, changed the name. You did the docks uh, too. Yeah, yeah. You, it was the docks. It was just converting to another name. Mm -hmm. And now they got bought out by the guy who owned government. But I used to be a floater for that for that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, twenty. The last club I ever actually worked at was Park Deal Drink. That was very nice. It was level. I used to sit in the back and chill in the patio. Yeah. You know, it's more like a socializing club. A lot of the men from the hood came there. Mm -hmm. They never really messed up anything because it was their hood and because they knew the owner. Mm -hmm. So Park Deal was more like if you had a problem. You kind of went to the owner and it, or you talked to um, another dude that worked there that knew all these guys. So, you know, it was more kind of level. You know, we had some fights now and again, but those are just people like outsiders that would come and, you know, they don't know the area. So they they just start trouble. Yeah. But, um. So that's when I, I, I ended my career um, pretty much because of my knee, but also because, you know, knowing that I was getting married, mm -hmm. knowing that I'm, I'm, you know, changing my lifestyle to become a Christian and a believer in God. It's a conflict of interest, okay. you know. I mean, you gotta be what you're. Sorry. What age were you? What age were you now? Can you? I was. Uh, I, I think I did it up until 45, 44. Mm -hmm. So I've been retired now about five years. Five, yeah, five years. About forty five. Yeah. Okay. So for me, that was kind of like my calling. Plus the gun things, you know, like you're getting threatened all the time. I mean, and nowadays threats are real. You know, a lot of people, if they say they're going for their burner, they're going for something, they're, they're really doing it. Not back in the day, you know, they give you the gun figure, it's like, okay, sure, buddy, you know what? But now it's real. Mm. So there was there was a combination of things that led me to think, okay, this is this is not a good look. You know, mm. like this is something that, you know, you're living a Christian life, you're a believer, you love God. How can you find yourself in the club? I mean, you're a man, you have eyes, right? Mm. You're getting married. Mm -hmm. It's not a good look for you to be in the club and all these women are coming on to you and, and, and you're seeing things that you wouldn't see in a church. <laughs> Yeah. Right, 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 right. You might say, well, actually, I can't say you see it in a church, but it's a little bit more tamed, you know? Yeah, yeah. So when you're in that environment, you're surrounded by people that are drinking, you're surrounded by alcohol, you're surrounded by, you know, you're at risk. And it so part of it was because of I knew I was getting married, and part of it was because it was coming, you know, it was coming to my time. And then of course, more importantly, I was giving my life to God and I was trying to find my place in the spirit of God. So it's it's not a good place for me to be. Mm. And it was a blessing that um, I had, you know, committed to a new lifestyle. So now when I when I got the, the DZ draw the DZ driver job, it was kind of in the midst of doing the bouncing on the side, right? Because the bouncing for me was just like a weekend thing. Yeah. And um I was working as a DZ driver for a company called Cast Staffing Limited, but I was working for um subcontract through like Dane Ross. 
And then I started working for another company where they were delivering, um, uh, what's it called? Um, construction materials. Okay. So I was only in training and the guy had parked like the, all of the areas you were delivering to were on construction sites. Mm -hmm. So you know, you're driving this big truck and you got to go into all these tight places. So long story short, he parked on an icy patch. And when I got out of the truck, I was still holding on. My foot slipped, took a sharp turn to the left. And I felt this shooting pain go all the way up my leg. And it was, it was real pain, like real, real pain. Yeah. So I went to work the next day, but I was limping. And then I think it was the day after that I called the temp agency and I said, you know what? I, I'm not comfortable with this job. I, you know, I've injured myself. I'm not feeling good. They're like, well, let us know if it escalates. By Sunday, I was in a hospital room. Wow. I had torn my ligament in two different places. So I, I tore my meniscus in two places. Ah, the yeah. pain was, and I mean, some people get torn ligaments and it's, it's not that deep, but for me, mm -hmm. I couldn't walk. I mean, and my wife's a, you know, she's a bigger lady. She's thick, you know, she's, she's strong, but it was hard. She had to like practically carry me to mm -hmm. a wheelchair. It was, it was excruciating. I honestly, if I had an enemy, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. It was, it was a pain that was so unbearable. Yeah. Um. So I ended up on basically WSIB. Yeah. And, you know, I still stayed with the company and um, moving forward, they basically hired me as a data entry clerk. And then I progressed to a recruiter. Okay. But during that time that I was on WSIB, I had a lot of time on my hands, which brings me out to the hot sauce. Yes. So when I when I thought of the hot sauce, the hot sauce was just a me thing. Wait, cause... hold on. Hold on. Now I'm going to stop you just for a minute, man. <laughs> Yo, first of all, I got to tell you, I appreciate you sharing all this information and yeah. I love how you transformed your life. And I feel like a connection with you because we're the same age. We grew up in Toronto and the surrounding areas and I didn't have that life. You know what I mean? So yeah. when I hear people um, sharing their stories, I'm yeah. like, I, f I feel for them. And I'm like, I, I think it's a lot of the things that you went through as a child too, when you bounce yeah, around yeah. and thing where I came from a stable home and all that, my parents are still together. It yeah, does yeah. a lot to you. Right. And you know, I want to get into the hot sauce and I yeah, still yeah. got to come see you at one of your events. Yeah, yeah for sure. Some, right. But rewind for a minute. Sure. I sure. want to ask you two things. Yeah. yeah. you grow growing, you grew up in London. What music oh, were, sorry. I was born in London. Born in you're, London. Yeah. You're born in London. And then and came to Toronto at age 10. Toronto. So in that, from zero to 10, what were you listening to? Because <laughs> when you first heard dance hall and hip hop and even soca and all that stuff, what was it like for you? Because I just want to know this before we get into yeah, the yeah. class. That's one of no, the things. No, I no, no, it's no problem. Um, zero to 10, I was, I, I was listening to like pop music, rock. I was listening to not, he not heavy metal, but like, um, like, I don't even say hardcore rock, but this is something like, like I didn't go as roses, far as Guns and Roses, yeah, and like Guns and Roses, you know, like I, you know, some of that. Mm -hmm. And it's funny you mentioned that because I didn't, I didn't say that part. But when I first came to Toronto, I had a ghetto blaster. Yeah, and I was walking through. I was, I was at thirteen fifty Danforth. I'll never forget this day. Yeah, I was walking through the park and, I, and they took my radio from me. And they said, Nah, bro. They said, We're not doing that. <laughs> you can't be chilling with us. <laughs> and be listening to this. Yeah. And that's when I first got into hip hop. So my first, um, my first, I, but the first, the first time I was subjected to any music that was urban related was hip hop. So it was like back in my day, it was Run DMC, EPMD, right. mm -hmm. um, BDP, mm -hmm. uh, the Beastie Boys, you know. So I was, I was into hip hop in the beginning. So I started originally started kind of swaying towards the hip hop. So the Adidas, the shell top shoes. Mm -hmm. In fact, my boy gave me a pair of shell top shoes and they were beat up and my mom didn't have a lot of money. So I would have to go in and and steal the, the whitener, the shoe yeah. white from the yeah. from or whatever, and I would paint it. And yeah. then she, she would, oh, it gets deep. Like she would send me to school with like bell bottoms and I would have to pin them because I'm like, nah, mom, I can't be, you know, I, I can't be wearing this. I respect the fact you don't have a lot of money, but I yeah. can't. <laughs> and she would give me orange tab, like Levi's orange tab. I'm like, nah, this is not going to work. That's not going to work. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> My girl wearing a red tab and I'm wearing orange tab and GWG bells. So I said, <laughs> I said, so I quickly changed my style, which of course ended up, you know, causing me to have to steal stuff. Or yeah. in my case, I didn't always steal things. I was a hustler from time. I used to go pop bottle collecting. Mm -hmm. So I would literally go around in a cart and knock on people's door and say, Hey, do you have any bottles that, you know, you want to give up? 
I would walk around and shovel people's snow. I was a big time hustler. So, I mean, I was, I was criminal minded. I was young. I wanted certain things, but I knew how to hustle too legally, like right. so, so to speak. So mm-hmm. I would collect as many bottles as I could, bring it to the LCBO or the beer store, or whatever, yeah. cash in on it. I was actually uh, a big fan of Prince back in the day. I remember when I when I when I first collected enough money, I went and I got a Prince, um, the Prince single. I was so happy, bro. You know, yeah, what yeah. I mean? <laughs> so hip hop and that type of stuff. And then I kind of converted from the hip hop more into like the reggae because when I moved to Bay Mills, mm-hmm. my boy was from Bay Mills. Yeah. So that's when I I converted from hip hop to hardcore reggae so now i'm in the i'm in glendower earthquake sound crew basement dances yeah mills basement dances chester lee basement dances every weekend so i'm 16 years of age and i'm there bubbling up in this dark basement can't see a thing you got you know you got a flash of lighter for you to see yeah. in front of you <laughs> and i would be like one of the only why i think 99 percent of the time I was like the only white dude that would ever be coming out of these basement dance, but I'd always come out lucky, you know what I mean? Because yeah. you, you know, you have a little bubble, a little wine, all of a sudden things change, right? A little alcohol, yeah. it was weed. <laughs> yeah. So that was my that was my broad up in terms of you know the I didn't really do the clubs at those times because I was too young. Yeah. So I was I was doing the basement dance. In fact, I'll actually I'll tell you a story about a basement dance that stopped me from doing. And this is and you can actually look up his name and I, and you know may his soul rest in peace. There was a young kid by the name of Kareem O'Brien. I'll never forget his name, and I'll never forget the incident. I, and I, I don't know. I'll try not to get too, too graphic. You can edit it if you want to, by all means. So I'm going to give you a heads up. Yeah. But um, I was in a basement dance in Chester Lee. And the people that were holding the basement dance, um, the parents of the, the sons that were the, playing the music were actually Christians as well. And I met them later on in a church when I first got baptized, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. So they were having like a one love jam. So this was supposed to be a cultural one love movement, you know, and um, a dude, I was, I was standing at the bottom of the stairs. I can remember like it's yesterday. I was wearing a banana yellow click suit, top to bottom, black belly boots, mm-hmm. black furry kango, gold teeth, the whole night. You know what I mean? Yeah. All of a sudden I hear plop, plop. I was like, whoa. And I mean, I'm high, bro. I'm high. I'm drunk. You know what I mean? And, and my boys beside me, they turn on the lights and the man on the mic, yeah, I'm on firecrackers. And I'm like, firecrackers? Know, black people live on the firecracker, no basement dance. That don't make no sense, right? Yeah. So lights go off, plop, 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 plop. I feel something hit my chest. I blacked out, bro. By the time I, I, I don't know what happened. I must have blacked out for maybe like a split second. When I could visually see, the kid was lying on the ground. His one hand was out here. The other hand was out here. His hat was in front of him. And he was bleeding, funneling from his head, bro. And it was the most grotesque moment for me. But when you're so high and you're so drunk, you're not taking it in like that. And I've always been one of those people that love like forensic files and that type of stuff. So this was real for me, but it was so surreal. And he was only 15. His mom told him, because I read the article on it, his mom told him not to go out that night. And he went and bailed anyways. And I feel so bad because I know that he wasn't a target. I think either somebody else was a target mm-hmm. or some dodo bird was doing a gun salute inside the basement and probably just couldn't manage a gun or he was whatever it was. I don't, I mean, I have, I have no clue. I don't even know if they ever caught the, the killer. I don't think they did, mm-hmm. but it was a very, very sad moment for me. And then it led me to think maybe that was for me, but I'm thinking, okay, I mean, I wasn't that bad. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I did a few robberies, but it was always like out in the outskirts somewhere. It wasn't really somewhere where anybody would be. I wouldn't rob another person from the hood or so, you know, we would go rob some white dude coming out of a Walmart or, we see him you know, with the sneakers. We would go up and, you know, hey, bro, you know, like man up and we take your sneakers from. But it was never like, you know, like how these guys do it now, right? Yeah. So that stopped me from going to basement dances because that was like shooting started to become more, more rampant. In fact, there was one more basement dance I was supposed to go to out in um, Markham. They had they had so they had a lot out in Markham and um, I want to say Markham and Steele's area. In the is this the nineties now or the early two? Yeah, yeah, we're moving into the nineties. So I was maybe six. I was still young. I was maybe 16, 17 them times. Right. So you had a lot of basement dances. But you know, as a young and you can go. I wouldn't know. You know, nobody stopping you at the door, right? Right, right. So I was headed to another basement dance, and I heard a shooting had happened there. So that was my. That was it. I I never went to a basement dance ever since that that particular night. But that experience was something that I'll live for for the rest of my life. 
And then the thing is that the police came to my door the next day and had the audacity to say that they, they that people pointed the finger at me. Mm -hmm. I told him, I said, bro, I said, officer, I'm a white dude in a party with 200 black people. Mm -hmm. You think that if I was to fire off a round, that I would still be standing up there at the end of the night preaching to people about gunshots and, and murder and things? I, I said, come on, man, use your common sense, man. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know what happened. All I know is I heard the shots. I felt something hit my chest. My my whole chest was filled with like was blood spatter on my chest. I said, that's all I know. You guys had an opportunity to talk to me last night. They were out there. There was blood on me. And they never said a word to me. Mm -hmm. They had to come knocking on my door at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I'm still dead asleep. But it was, it, was, it was rough, man. It was a really, really, it's one of those experiences. And I've experienced a lot of things in life, far too much that I could ever really get into, you know, yeah. in this podcast. But right, right. for me, that was, that was an eye-opener. Just like having torn my ligaments stop me from bouncing. You know, my pastor told me that the angel of heaven have been watching over me. You know, I've been threatened. I've been in the club with shots fired off where I could have got ricocheted and could have got killed. I've been threatened. I've been rushed. I was supposed to purchase a gun and ended up in jail as a result. Imagine had I got that gun with my temperament, I would have shot somebody for sure. Mm -hmm. Shooting somebody doesn't make you a bad man. You know what I mean? Just means you have the ability to pull the trigger of a gun, you know? And, and that was my mentality back then. It's like, okay, well, what's the purpose in fighting when you could just take somebody out? But the angels of heaven seem to have been consistently watching over me and, and redirecting my path because I could have got killed as a bouncer the amount of times I got threatened. I mean, I'm not hard to find. I'm, I'm a white dude that speaks Patwa that, that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. So if somebody really had it out for me, like if, if this was in today's day, I'd be dead straight up. That's, 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 a, that's a matter of fact, right? Yeah. You know, you can't blend in. There's no mistaken identity. It's yeah. that white dude right there. <laughs> it's right. not, hard to, it's not hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. So, that was the end of my of my basement. I forgot where we're going with this now. Yeah. This no, you answered the question. I'm I'm glad you yeah. gave some of those stories because I wanted to know about the music and you let me know how it transitioned to the hip hop. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So, so the second one before we get into the hot sauce too. Yeah, no, for that, sure. Then I want to do the would you rather question because this is going to be interesting to yeah, me. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, the second one was the friends. So we know a mutual person, right? Sean Thibodeau. So Sean was like that white guy in our right, neighborhood, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I love Sean, man. And um, he does the hot sauce thing too. But um, we grew up since public school, right? Right, right, right. But um, when you came, was there any other white young youth that was hanging around the black uh, crowd um, when you went to different areas? So you might have been the only one in your area. But how was it for others? Was that was there a couple of white guys that you could relate to in that on that level? There's one person in particular I never really got that close to him, but his name was Teddy Ruxpin. That's that's what he used to call him. He was from Jane and Finch. Yeah, he Jane. Now see, speaking of Jane and Finch, Jane and Finch back in the day, and and it could still be this way now, despite the gangs, you know, the, the you know what's happening in the gang world. Mm -hmm. But Jane and Finch was a very multicultural type of environment. And it was far different from Scarborough. Yeah. What I found as a white guy is that when you went to Jane and Finch, the level of respect, once they knew you were affiliated with somebody in Finch, because King Lou from the Dream Warriors was like, all I had to do was say, oh, I used to just call him my cousin. I didn't even know, if, you know what, what affiliation he was, right? Yeah. But being that he was my my stepfather's brother, they'd be like, oh, no, what, you know, King, King Lou, what? And you're just blessed. But yeah. Jane and Finch was, was, um, was white black brown it didn't matter what race you were mm. if you were from finch you were well respected but to be honest bro in scarborough i didn't find that i didn't find that unity i found that you were more an outcast mm. unless you grew up in the area mm. you know but i and, I, and it was always a conflict and that's why i gravitated more to the west end because i got different treatment i got more respect i could go to anybody in finch and, and it was a very there was no hotheads or in my personal experience. Yeah. Um, so Teddy was the only person that I knew. He used to actually live one or two doors down from Louis, from um, from Louis's house. And and he was, but he was a different kind of white, very, very mellow. He wasn't about the vibrant colors like how I was. For me, I, I wanted to stand out. I've always been an attention seeker. So yeah, yeah. where he would just wear like a brown khakis and a shirt, you know, he never really glamorized where me i'd be wearing like a red bally suit you know a, a, a 
you know, uh, the, the yellow banana suit, you know, like the black corduroy with the big, like I was always standing out. I yeah. looked up normal from it. You could see me from a mile away. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's white dudes here and there, but never, I never really gravitated. And that's the funny thing too, is that, and I, and I think that a part of the reason why now this is my guess is that having a white father, mm-hmm. obviously that never really you know what I mean? Never showed me the love and the, 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 uh, you know, the admiration that I, that I needed, the, the, you know, from a father. Right. So when I became really close friends, um, like from my boy from, from Bay Mills, I gravitated to him like a brother, but mm-hmm. in a sense, they almost become like a father because they, you know, these people take you under their wing, right? They bring you, it's my, my culture, it's yours. Right. Yeah. So when he brings me into his culture, he defends me, he protects me. He says, no man he's good he's blessed he's you know what don't worry about it he's black just like us you know what i mean even though your skin is not black you will be recognized as a black man even though you're a white man and and that is because if that black person is respected you will earn and get that same respect provided you don't do anything to you know to jeopardize that right um now i haven't dated or been with a white woman since i was 15 Mm -hmm. i think maybe 15 16 and Part of that, I believe, is because of, you know, the culture I'd taken on and, and learning to understand, you know, the Jamaican culture and gravitating to it. But not only that, my mom abandoned me, too. So at age 13, she put me in a group home. And that's where the, the life of crime began. So yeah. even though between 10 and 13, you know, having been around my mom, having been around my stepfather, that was the that was the stepping stone to me getting involved in the urban culture and learning the Jamaican culture and whatnot. But from age 13, it was me in the hood. It was me and the brothers. It was me and the sisters. Yeah. And the sisters took care of me as well, because even though I was out there playing the field, they gave me the emotion. They gave me the the attention that I needed. They gave me the nurturing, the love that my mom never gave me. Mm. So people don't realize that when you come from broken families, you look for a way to mend that, you know, whether it be through crime, whether it be through drugs, whether it be through alcoholism, whether it be through womanizing, whether it be whatever it is. But you find these 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 things to compensate for what you're not getting. And even in my relationship now with my wife, I overwhelm her with love. Like I give her more love than she can manage at times. And that's not something she's accustomed to because she, she came from a loving mother and a loving father. Right. So that could be challenging for somebody who doesn't require that much love. My wife requires me to love her. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, I, I over love. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could tell her I love her a hundred times a day. She'd be like, babe, it's okay. I, I get it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it's overcompensation because of what I just never received, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, being in foster homes, being in group homes, being in jail, you don't learn. Nobody's there hugging you. You know, mm-hmm. nobody's there loving you, showing you that nurturing. Like you said, you come from a two-parent family, and 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 that's a blessing. But I look at now between my wife and God, that's where I endure my love. Even though I can't yeah. physically touch God, mm-hmm. I feel the blessings. I'm never without. I, I mean, I could be in debt, but I still have money, if that makes any sense, you know? It does. It does. There's never there's never a day without food on the table. You may grump and, and, and carry on, but I'm always, always blessed. Money comes from places that I never dreamed of it coming from sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I still have a desire for more. Yeah. My business is still growing. It's still invest, reinvest. But I'm, I'm honestly, bro, I wake up every morning and I give God thanks and I go to sleep every night and I give God thanks because at the end of the day, and I tell people this all the time, life is not promised. I don't care what God you want to believe in, but believe this, we have no control over death. You know what I mean? And it doesn't matter whether you believe in Allah, whether you believe in God, whether you believe in King Salas, it doesn't matter. One thing that we all need to understand is that whatever you decide to believe in, death is real. You know what I mean? And when we wake up and we go to sleep and when we, when we're angry, we have to watch what we say. We, Mm -hmm. we have to, you know, like you mean, you could be talking right now and tomorrow I could be gone. Mm -hmm. And then what? The only thing that's left is star Scorpios. You know what I mean? Like, you you know, you're real talk with me and that's it. Yeah. You know? And and then after a few months to a year, people forget about you. I mean, they don't forget, forget, but life goes on. And and that's, that's the reality of it. Right. So. Yo, Emmanuel, yo, thanks for sharing all this, man. Thank yeah, you. No and your words are wise. And I want to ask you something before I get into this question next. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel that you personally, with the challenges, the struggles, the hardships, 
that you've been in, do you feel and with God now in your life, there's nothing you can't you can't do. Do you have that feeling now where you're not afraid to do anything? I have, you know what, when when you have the spirit of God in you, like mm -hmm. they, they say that nothing is impossible, nothing is too impossible for God. So I wouldn't say it's me, but I believe deep down inside that whatever I set my mind to doing, if it's God's will, it it will come to fruition. Okay. You know, and and I struggle a lot. I want my business to be so much further than what it is. Mm -hmm. But then you have to really set your mind on are you ready for that? Mm -hmm. You know. I've learned that God will give you God. They say God will never give you more than you can handle. Right. So even though our minds, we may want so much more, but if you get it too fast, it may run, it, it may run away from you or you may get caught up. Like for example, if, if I became rich tomorrow, what would I do with that? I got to remember my place. I can't forget God because they say to forget God. It's like, look at yourself in the mirror, forget what you look like, you know? So as much as I want certain blessings in my life, I have to appreciate the steps and stages in which I'm blessed today because when we talk now and I look back 40 years, look where I was, you right. know, even 25 years ago, look where I was. And here I am today and I'm still progressing, but I'm still blessed. I have a beautiful wife. I'm living in a beautiful area. You know, I have a secure job. I have money in the bank. I have good credit, you know, things that I never had before, mm. bad credit, you know, living a criminal life you know, jug up three meals a day, you know? So we, we really have to, even with my ligament, when I, when I tore my ligament, mm -hmm. bro, I thought life was over. I never felt so much pain, bro. I was in tears, brother, tears. And then I think that has all come to pass. But why, why did that happen? It brought me to a place of humbleness mm -hmm. because sometimes we don't realize that God does things to humble your spirit because you're too far ahead of yourself. Yeah. You're out there doing things that God knows is not, you're not hitting down the right path. What if I remained a bouncer? I'd probably be dead. Mm -hmm. What if I never met my wife? I probably wouldn't be living my life for God the way that I am now and giving God the praise and the glory that he deserves. There's a lot of things that, that had God just allowed me to do what I wanted to do, I wouldn't be where I am today, mm -hmm. you know? Yo, thanks for sure. Have you ever done a, something like this before? Like, I've done so well spoken. This is this is very personal. This one I've most of the podcasts, have, in fact, all the podcasts I've ever done have never gotten this personal. So this is going to be the first time mm. that people will get a chance to hear mm. my real life story. Mm. You know, this was not this is not pre thought up. This was you know this is just me telling you, and people out there are going to find out things about me that they never knew. Mm. People know me now as Mister Tunup and Emmanuel. That's it. Yeah, they don't know anything about my past. They don't have no idea the crosses and the things that I did and been through in the foster homes and the group homes and the jail. They don't know none of that, mm. you know. So I was kind of leery. I I'm not gonna lie to you. I was kind of leery about doing this because I knew I was gonna talk very personal about myself. But yeah. you know, to speak personal about yourself in your previous lifestyle, if you've come away from that, it can turn out to be education to people to think you know because you got people out there to think I can't do it. Yes, you can. Mm. I never dreamed of being an entrepreneur. In fact, my wife said to me, oh, you, why don't you become an entrepreneur? I didn't even know what entrepreneur meant. Yeah. I had to look it up. I'm like, what is an entrepreneur? Yeah. You know, and here I am today and I have a, I'm a small business owner. I'm an entrepreneur and everything I get from this is a blessing to me. It's yeah. not even so much about the money sometimes. When somebody says, bro, I love your hot sauce. That's a compliment. That's big. because That's me. You know, yeah. and I stand behind my product and I put it out there and I, all the hard work you put into it. You know, it's one thing to work for somebody. Mm. It's another thing to work for yourself yeah. because you have to own your business. You have to own the customer service behind it. Mm. Somebody comes to you and says something, you have to take in and accept that constructive criticism. I couldn't do what I'm doing now with the spirit I had before mm. because I would have cussed people off. We yeah. we really see it all that hot. Thing, the thing, because I had hot sauce that was popping on people. Yeah, you know, I wasn't cooking it properly. It's, it's a learning curve. Yeah, you know, is this? What do you mean? Like I would get really defensive, but when 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 God humbles your spirit, now you're able to take those things and say, you know what? I'll, I'll run with that. Let me let me you know let me take that in and see what I can do. Or, you know, your customer service skills change because. Not just because it's your business doesn't mean you can't be rude or ignorant. There's a lot of ignorant people out there, a lot of ignorant businesses out there. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say that when when God does things and has timing, he knows what's best because this wouldn't have been good for me 10 years ago. 10 years ago, yeah. I, it wouldn't have been good at all. It would, I mean, it would have been an amazing product, but the person behind it wouldn't have been good. I was too aggressive. 
I was too temperamental. I was too judgmental. I was, everything was negative. Mm -hmm. So how then can I run a business on those vibes, on that spirit, man? It's not, yeah. that's not healthy. Yeah. It probably so, would have went under. You know yeah. It would have went under. Yeah. I would have lost customers. If people would have been like, oh, you don't want to talk to that guy, man. I got to yeah. pop off. Man. <laughs> yeah. You tell him you want two hours off, me, you go fly off the handle. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay. Yo. So that's why I like, now we're going to turn the page in your life. So I'm glad you shared this your 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 background with us um because that's why i started this too i want to share stories of people's lives it's not always rainbows and flowers whatever they want to, whatever they want to say some people have the hardship and if they're willing to share it on this platform i i really appreciate it because we're going to turn the page and we're going to talk about ton up hot sauce but before we do here's a question for you and i'm i i love like your story let's see where it goes all right it's a would you rather question. Would you rather visit your younger self and give them advice for the future? Or would you rather visit your older self and have them give you advice for what's going on right now? Okay, so knowing what I know now, would I rather go back in time and educate? I would rather go back in time and educate. Mm -hmm. Knowing what I know now and the youth of today's day, the, the it, it breaks my heart. The, the the you know I was just watching I was in fact I was I was watching some videos today on the crime in Toronto, the black on black crime, bro. These are people with like hip hop. I'm not a hip hop fan anymore, mm -hmm. and I don't know much about it. But you can tell when somebody has lyrical content when they have expertise. You got people out there that have expertise. You know. I love the black race because you guys are so talented. You know what I mean? Like talented basketball, sports, manufacturing things, inventing things. This goes back in time. The youth of today's day are not utilizing those skills and, and reflecting on what's positive. It's creating pure conflict and war. And, and if I could, if, if I could educate the youth of today's day and convert them to really appreciate and love God and have God fill them, you know, and, and take their talents to a different level. I think the world will be a different place because at the end of the day right now, the youth is what is the upcoming, like they're the future. And, and, you know, and the things that are happening with the youth nowadays in all races, but, you know, unfortunately predominantly a lot, a lot in the black race, the younger black races that they're not even living past 25, bro. Mm -hmm. That's not a life. You know what I mean? So I didn't live a gangster life. I lived a troubled life. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to be gangster. I thought I was gangster. But when you look at real gangster life now, yeah. I didn't live a gangster life. I never cared. I never did all that crazy. I did some crazy stuff. I got in you know, jail. I got in trouble. But if I could just take back the hands of time and go back to them and say, you know what? This is what your future is going to look like. Is it really worth it to you? And, and just change their spirit, man. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the youth nowadays, they're not looking past tomorrow. They're living in the riches of today. Right. And, you know, and we're not really supposed to predict futuristically, but you have to at some point, regardless, because you want to be able to say, where am I going to be in five years time from now? Yeah. And, and it, it breaks my heart, bro, because the crime rates and, and all of these things, the killings, especially, you know what I mean? Brothers, sisters, people are getting killed, bro. Parents are losing their parents. Children are dying before parents, bro. Yeah. That's not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So to sum it up, one hundred percent, I I would I would definitely take all of the knowledge that I have today and everything that I've learned and 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 everything that I every every ounce of spirituality that I could, and I would go back and I would say, listen, don't go down this road. You want to live a long, healthy life. This is not the way, man. Mm -hmm. I had a pastor that actually wanted me to preach to the youth, and I. And I, I just don't feel like I, maybe I'm undermining myself, but I feel like I don't have enough to give them because I never lived, you know, no, like this is what I was going to ask you, though, to to share your story and knowledge and give words of inspiration. I didn't know to who, but you yeah, just yeah. said that that imagine yeah, it was a pastor you, that, that told me, you know, and it's and he said that you could really preach to the youth and. And, you know, and, and like I said, I mean, it's hard for them. Like, you know, the, the, the life back then, the mm -hmm. wannabe gangster life back then was different than it is now. But it's still it, it's still the same mindset. It's still the same concept. It's just now it's it's escalated. You know what I mean? Right. Back then it wasn't death. It was it was you see your enemy and you, you put a beating on them, you know, or you get into a conflict or, you know, you avoid certain areas. But now it's it's 
it's it's far too extreme mm. and, and you know and 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 that's all it is they the youth are killing youth no nobody's becoming an adult yeah. in the hood you know and even even in Gina Finch for example you know these areas are now they're they're apart back mm. then Finch was Finch bro it didn't matter whether your connection you know lane if you were driftwood you were a Finch man yeah. now you got man's beefing with man's in the same hood bro like that to me that's crazy like what what brought it to that place you know harmony like living in unity you know and and a lot of black people preach about this that there's a lack of unity mm -hmm. you know some people will say well white people this white people that white people don't have anything bro you know what i mean we just we just we just we just do things differently but we still undercut one another. We still do crazy stuff if within my race, but we just do it on a more legal matter. Mm -hmm. You know, we do we we kind of undercut people in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. But if the if the black race, bro, and, and believe me when I say this, and the black race, and I and I think you can attest to this, if they came together as one and unified, bro, you guys would take over the universe. Trust I don't care what nobody says, bro. You know what I mean? With the strength, with the talent, you know, with with everything, you know, there's so much to give. And you know, a lot of Jamaicans are are very like when you go to Jamaica, a lot of them are like they're they're very cultural, bro. They love God. Mm. You know, it's it's oh, man, it it it, I, it 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 really touches my heart, bro. The violence, it really, really, really touches my heart, bro. Yeah, I get it. it. And, and I see that you we both seen it change over the years. Uh you were more in in the know where I wasn't. Yeah. I would have to read yeah. a paper but you probably knew some of the things that were going yeah. on personally stuff right yep, yeah yep. definitely go back okay now no matter if my guest chose their younger self or their older self this is about your younger self what would you tell your younger self about money man that's you know what i i believe investment like you know take your money okay Back then, when I was when I was selling a little marijuana and I had a little booze can and that, I was making three grand a month. 16, 17 years old, I was I was let out of um, I don't know if you call it a halfway house, but it's like a halfway house, and I was given a temporary release where I could go and make money. Mm. My boss was Jewish. He was he was running some big mob thing behind the scenes, which I had no idea he was doing. I just thought this guy was great because he gave me everything I wanted, including an apartment everything mm. i was making so much money back then but all i did was splurge it jewelry gold teeth every week you know back then it was you know you get the gold teeth you pop it in you know two twos later you know you gotta get a new one mm. i spent so much money on gear that if i knew what i knew now i would have became an entrepreneur with that money a long time ago and i would be so so much better off where i am today yeah. and if you're not good with becoming an entrepreneur speak to somebody who can help you invest your money that you know you can trust because in today's day i'm still struggling like mm -hmm. i gotta be real you know it's 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 a struggle but if i was making all that money back then and i became an entrepreneur or i was investing i would be so much like 30 years oh yeah. man i would be i would be tremendous and i guess i'm not blessed i would be tremendously blessed yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> and, and, and that's the big thing is that and, and, and even going back to these dudes that are on the street you know they're hustling mm -hmm. all of that money where is it going mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's going into all these things that you can't take with you build for yourself so that when you have children you can pass it on to your children build an empire so that you know you have that legacy and you can pass that on because when my father passed, for example, he passed um, two years ago. You know, oh, may his soul rest in peace. Sorry about that. And no, no, it's it's, it, it's that's another topic. But I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's it was sad because I'm going to off topic just a little bit. But I never knew him, mm -hmm. so for years he was never a part of my life. And only over the last ten years, I came to forgive him because biblically speaking, you have to forgive, especially when it comes to your parents. So I forgave him, not knowing he was going to die. He laid, he laid deceased in his bed for five days by himself. Nobody knew in Windsor with his two dogs. That's not a life that I want to live. And he left back enough money to basically pay for his funeral and a little, and a little change on top of that, which he was building for me because we, we had built our rapport. But, and I'm not saying that when a parent passes, you know, we're, we're sitting here with our hands open and say, okay, you know what? Give me, give me, give me. Yeah. But 
if we all established ourselves as youngins converting into adults, and then we think of, you know, our life and how the struggles that we went through, why should our children suffer too? But again, for me, I was selfish. So I'm trying to build my empire. I'm trying to build my legacy so that if, you know, God allows me to see another 30 years, I have something to pass down to my kids because I want to pass before them. And, and that's really important. And we don't follow this philosophy, a lot of us. You know, we we think of ourselves and ourselves only and what can we do for ourselves. But we're not thinking that when our when we come to pass, our children are still there. Right. You know, and, and yes, they should equally do for themselves and follow suit in, in that philosophy. But we can help them, give them a house so they can move into if they don't have one, especially now. The times are tough economically. <laughs> yeah. If you can leave something behind for your children so that they don't have to suffer the way we suffered. Yeah. That's the way it should be. Gener you know, like generational wealth. Boy. Generation. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Take that positive and. And, and, and leave with a legacy, leave with something that your children, and even if you don't want my business, you can sell it, Yeah, but it's worth money, mm -hmm. you know? So right. yeah, it's, I, I would, I would definitely do that in a heartbeat. Okay. Yeah. Yo, you're kicking knowledge. What would you tell your younger self about family? Family is, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to go back to the Bible on this. The Bible preaches about fornication. The Bible preaches about, you know, it or teaches, I don't say preaches, it teaches that we are to get married and have a family. Clearly, I have four kids. I, that didn't happen, you know. Um, I think that if we all took a step back and, and, and waited the appropriate time to try to find the right person and build on a family like yourself with your mom and dad, you know, history becomes so much different. No child should have to live without a sibling unless it's something that mechanically you, your body can't produce another child. But more importantly, no child should be with only one parent because one parent, it's too hard and too strenuous. And I've seen it time and time again, even for myself. I took my daughter at age nine, when she was age nine, and I fathered her by myself, you know, and and it and it's a struggle because as a man or a woman, you can only do so much. You can play both roles, but only to a certain extent. There's a certain nurturing that a father will give to a to a son or a daughter, and there's a different nurturing that a mother will give. And and that's why you know God created us, man and woman, to you know to come together and and we're supposed to be technically be married and be able to raise our children as a two-parent family not just for, you know, economics purpose, but for love, for nurturing, you know, for support. It just, it, it just goes hand in hand. So when, when these young people are out there and you're doing this and you're doing that, yeah, it's all fine and dandy, but now you're creating a legacy of, of children and you're not going to be able to parent them properly because you're too busy out there spreading your seed all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a lot of women and, and men do this more than women you're out there and you're breaking hearts and you're not, you're not a two parent family. You're not a stable family. Mm. I never had a brother. You know, I envy people like my, my wife has an amazing relationship with her father. I almost break down when I see the two of them together. I'm like, I would love to have that. I, you know, like what would life be like if I had a father, my father was mechanically inclined, knew how to do auto body. He knew about electronics all of these things are supposed to be passed on. These traits that we understand and know are supposed to be passed on because some of them, we don't, we don't know them, but you learn them through parenting, you know, through, through your parents and whatnot. And I never learned none of that, mm. you know? So it, it's, it's sad to me. So I would, I would say family is everything. You know, if you can, if you can find somebody, marry them, be with them for the rest of your life, man, life is blessed. You know what I mean? And there's nothing wrong with it. So many things, bro, that the Bible preaches or to, the Bible teaches about, we don't follow. And people say, "Oh, the Bible's not real." Just look at some of the stuff that it talks about. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. These are these are real facts. Why do you think God says don't fornicate? We're living in a society where fornication is right, left, and center, and you got all these kids without without two parents. Yeah, you know what I mean? God is not dumb. Mm -hmm. He clearly made this a, a stipulation for us to follow because He knew what would happen if we don't. <laughs> And it's a reality. I'm living proof, you know? So I like how you answered that. Um, it's so true. So now this is going to lead to the next question. So everything you said about family, it makes sense. 
And um, I believe that too, man. Like, I don't know how it would be if I only had one parent. You know, some people are not fortunate to have two parents and things like that, but they make the best of it. And, you, you know, you live what you, you're right. given and things like that. But yeah, having the two. So now I want to know what you're going to say. What would you tell your younger self about friends? Oh, man, friends. <laughs> you know, friendship is something that I believe, and I've lost friends. I've lost friends out of out of my my anger, my temperament. You know, if you find a true friend, your friend should almost be like your brother or your sister, mm -hmm. you know, because in some cases, friends can be there for you more than family. They say mm -hmm. blood is thicker than water, 100%. Theoretically, yes. Yeah. But I've known friends, in fact, I, I mean, I have, a, I have a best friend, his name is Sean. This man has been there for me like my own like as if he was my own flesh and blood brother you know so friendship is something that you need to cherish you know when you have a good solid friend don't do them dirty man you know don't do them dirty don't doesn't matter what it is cherish that friendship because true friends especially in today's day is very very hard to find society has changed so much when you're at our age at 50 we can find people to become acquaintances with, and we can even call them friends. But a true friendship takes years to build. Yeah. It takes yeah. understanding. Yeah. A true friend will be there for you in any possible circumstance that they can. Mm. You know what I mean? A friend will be there to, to he's your your friend, be it a woman or a man, is your vault. That's the person that you can tell. My boy, if you if you cut that dude, you will find every secret that I've ever you know I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Vault. and he will never tell you anything you can mm. ask him you're like oh well, you know what yeah. I mean? but that's <laughs> yeah. a friend he yeah. will never betray me i trust this guy with my life he, i used to bounce together and that's how we developed our friendship was through bouncing because through bouncing you have to have trust in your colleague because your life is on the line right but at the end of the day friendship is 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 almost more than family in some cases for a lot of people because a lot of family are, are not even treating their, you know, their own family members as they should. Mm. So when you have a good, solid friend, hold on to it, man. Do mm. everything you can to respect it. And if you get into a, and the mouth, man, you got to watch the mouth, bro. Like, and I've learned that the hard way. Mm. The, the, the Bible says the tongue is the hardest to tame. It's not what goes in the mouth that follows a man. It's what comes out. And it is so, so true. Yeah. You know, me and you could develop a very, very solid friendship. But if this mouth says the wrong things mm -hmm. it could destroy that friendship in seconds what you've taken years to build this same mouth can destroy in seconds you know so well, true yo this is so good this is so good now the last one this is an important one and because you have god in your life you have your lovely wife what would you tell your younger self about love and love is deep, bro. You know what? I I broke a lot of hearts, a lot of hearts. And it, and it breaks my heart to think of the amount of people's hearts. Like it's so real. You know, when you when you love somebody, it it's it's such an inner feeling. Like it's an it's an unbreakable feeling. Love is so, you know, the Bible talks about love so much, you know to love one another like Christ loves, you know, like Christ loves us, to love your wife like Christ loves the church. Do you know how much, like, to love your wife like Christ loves the church? So when he says Christ loves the church, he's talking about his people because we are the church. To have that kind of love, that takes patience, kindness. It, it takes forgiveness. <laughs> Bro, love is something that is, is so deep that it's the i don't even think real words can explain how important love truly is and when you truly truly love somebody unconditionally there's nothing that can penetrate that you're not going to cheat you're not going to do harm by them you know and and you may unintentionally say things out of anger but even then you you have to be able to forgive and to be able to you know and to be able to correct yourself like love is just it's amazing, bro. Like to be in love and to know you're loved, you can't get that anywhere else. And the, and the love between a husband and wife is you, you you're not going to get that from family. It's a different kind of love. Mm. 
when you wake up in the morning and you can look your spouse in the eyes and say, you know what, babes, I love you. That's deep, bro. When you go to bed at night and you kiss your spouse good night and you say, I love you. So for all them dudes out there playing the field, man, believe me, you don't know what you're missing, man. Because love, love will go through higher heights. When you have a partner that loves you, that person will have your back more than any one of them concubines or whatever it is you're doing out there because that's not real love. Yeah. No, it's facts, bro. It's you true. may think that they'll defend you, but at the end of the day, push comes to shove, man. Mm. They're, they're not real. You know what I mean? Love is what binds you, is what it what brings two spirits together. You know, the, the Bible speaks of that you will you will leave and become one. You will leave your parents, you know, but of five. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know all the Bible scriptures off by heart, but you know, you, you come together as one, you become one unit. Mm -hmm. So everything about you, you now your hearts become one, your minds, like everything becomes one. I mean, not physically, you know what I mean? But love is deep. So if you if you fall in love and you but you also have to be careful. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you may fall in love, but the person you think is in love with you is not. Yeah, that can be very, very hurtful. Yeah. So you have to be careful how you pace yourself, and, it, and it's hard to control emotions. Because I remember back in the day when I was out there, I'd be like, "Well, I'm not going to fall for this girl," but then you think you fell, but some, a lot of time you don't. You you fell in love with the fact that everything was groovy in the bedroom, or you know she could cook an awesome meal. Yeah. But do you really love her for her? Because if you love the person for who they are, you love them whether they look bad, whether the face breaks out, whether they put on weight, you know, whether they had a bad day, whether they lose their job, you know, you love that person all around unconditionally, and that's real, genuine love. That when you can go through thick and thin, honestly, Sean and his wife. They love one another. I, I've never seen. Okay, I can't say I've never seen, but I, I've I've rarely seen a love that those two have. I'm not going to get into all the personal details, but you and I both know that they have a love that that's on a different level, yeah. and that's real love. Yeah. So if we could all magnify and appreciate and come to acknowledge and accept and believe in that love, man, the world would be a better place, bro. Mm. <laughs> it really there would. Go. There you go. Yo, Emmanuel, thanks for sharing all that. Now we're getting into the hot sauce. Now, let me know first, because we were gonna you were gonna mention it first about, you know, we've been talking for a while now. I want to see if we can break the record at the podcast, but we're yeah. near we're near the end of it. But now it's all focused on the hot sauce. Yeah. And when did you start it? And I want to know um all the little the journey you took through making the perfect hot sauce, because you know, I was kind of familiar with sean tibido's uh um, yeah. hot sauce journey i want to hear your journey and on making that sauce and how you got it going the marketing and everything and i know you're doing a lot of um what do you call it man those uh events and things. Mark up up and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and you know what we have someone in common now but through this gentleman shanye shanye and his wife and his two partners they they got shark sauce c-h-r-k and he okay. was on my podcast with his wife I met Peace of Healing. Peace of Healing. Um, you follow her and I follow her too. Yeah, I'm, doing her, I'm doing her market tomorrow. Yes. Very, very nice lady. So very I, nice I, I wanted to get her on the cast too. But um, that's between Sean and her. That's how I found you on Instagram. Okay, too, okay. Right? But yeah, let's get that story going. All right. So um, the hot sauce came out when I tore the ligament on my left knee. Um, mm. My wife, my lovely wife, Jamaica Descent, she doesn't like heat. Mm. So... <laughs> <laughs> I used to always cook two meals okay. because I would try it. I try throw a scotch bonnet pepper in there, throw a little bit of hot sauce, throw a little chili powder. Mm -hmm. It was always too hot. It drove me crazy. Okay. I grew up learning how to cook from a Jamaican chef. One of my exes from back in the day, um, her mom owned a restaurant, Jamaican restaurant mm -hmm. on Queen Street in Toronto. So I learned how to cook and I, I started to indulge in more spicy food. So it was it was natural for me to cook with with heat. I, I just I just love to have that heat for me. Mm -hmm. And I came up with a batch of mango. Actually, I'll show you the bottle. You see it? Yep. So I came up with the mango hot sauce, which was my which was my first hot sauce. And I brought it to my church. My pastor, she's Jamaican descent. She used to eat peppers off tree. She loved it. Mm -hmm. So again, this was never meant to be a business. This was just me making some hot sauce so that I could stop cooking two meals yeah. <laughs> and my pastor was like she's like uh brother emmanuel i love this hot sauce you need to bring it back to church and we're gonna sell it as a fundraiser i was like okay so i had to go back to the drawing board make another batch brought it to the church she had the she had the uh the cook try it 
Everybody tried it. They loved it. Wow. It inspired me to, to make more. So I used to make it in these like 250 ml bottles, 750 ml bottles. I did everything backwards. Yes. No labels, no nothing. I just write on the labels, whatever. Yeah. And um, eventually I, I uh, transitioned into like the regular, you know, five ounce bottles and everything. And I got into my first retail retail restaurant, mm -hmm. which was called Delight Food. It's still there to this day, Jane and Shoreham. Okay. Um, my second retail was through GC Jerk Express. He's also a Christian believer of God. So that's how the journey began. Now, the name, I was sitting down on the couch and I said to my wife, I said, man, I said, yeah, I said, yeah, the hot sauce, turn up, you know. <laughs> that's a laugh. She goes, what do you mean? I said, turn up, man. The hot sauce is just that good. And that's how the name came out. I said, it's turn up and it's just that good. I said, that's it. And my spirit told me that's what it's going to be. Yeah. She's laughing at me, right? But, but my wife is like, she's very nonchalant about everything, right? So she don't really get head over heels with me. I'm, I'm like, yeah, man, no, that's it. That's it. That's it. Mm. So I, I told my pastor, I said, I want to call it turn up and I want the slogan to be it's just that good. She goes, brother Emmanuel, run with it. Yeah. And that's how the journey began. Now, the second hot sauce, which is this one, the uh the so ghost the mango, pepper mango. The, the mango was first and that's which one is that yeah. this is the ghost pepper mango ghost pepper man okay. so i came up with this one now when i first made this hot sauce i made it with um a ghost pepper powder and i didn't like the way it tasted i literally i said nah this is this is not cool mm. so i have a guy whose wife really loves hot sauce mm. i said bro you're welcome here take it man i got a couple liters i already threw it two liters you're welcome to take the rest his wife loved it. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I just threw out two liters of this expensive junction. <laughs> so I went back to the drawing board and I talked to the guy that I ordered the powder from. And he said, you're better to use dried pods. He goes, you can rehydrate them and then make a mash out of it and make your pepper, your, your hot sauce that way. Mm -hmm. So I literally mocked the mango flavor with the ghost pepper mango, but I added ghost pepper mash to it. So they're identical ingredients with the exception of the, the ghost pepper, but it has a completely different flavor, different heat level. And that's how I came up with the ghost pepper. Mm -hmm. Now, the pineapple one, which is this one, yeah. the pineapple one I came up with um, was really because a guy that I used to work with, he's like, yo, why don't you come up with a pineapple version? I'm like, pineapple hot sauce? I really heard of pineapple hot sauce. So I said, okay, cool. So I made a pineapple hot sauce, and um, I wasn't cooking it long enough. Mm -hmm. Put it on the shelf. So now I'm in like five, ten different stores. I put it on the shelf and it started to pop. Wow. So basically the bottles were the, oh. the hot sauce because of the, the 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 sugar content in the pineapple. It would sit in the bottle and then soon it was like a Coca-Cola. It would just boom. Yeah. I had to immediately take it out the shelf, revisit it, check the pH levels, recook it again. And then finally now it's, it's selling. Mm -hmm. The pineapple flavor, people don't buy it so much in retail unless they come to know how the product tastes. Because a lot of people assume that the pineapple version is going to be too sweet, but that's not the case. It has a hint of sweetness and then the heat kicks in right away. So I sell a lot of pineapple at events, but on a retail shelf, people say, oh, pineapple. The first thing that comes to your mind is that's going to be too sweet. I don't want that. Right. So my retail sales jump up more so when people try it and word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So I'm in about 20 locations right now. I am looking wow. to expand. Yeah. Um, I've been doing it for three years. So I started during COVID at the same time I tore a ligament in my left knee. Okay. Um, but things came to a slowdown because of COVID and because I work full time still. So this is only my side business. But now as of September, I'm going to be going with a co-packer where I'm going to make the sauce, bring it to them. They're going to bottle it. They're going to label it. All right. So they're going to shrink band it, seal it. And that way it'll take a lot of weight off my shoulders because my wife can't deal with the fumes. So mm. she'll help with like the, the labeling. She'll help me with the stamping. But she can't deal with the fumes. The fumes are too much for her. Yeah. So I'm at a place now where things have kind of plateaued and I'm just sitting there. Mm -hmm. So although I'm doing events, I'm getting I'm getting the word out there. And the, the retail stores I'm selling at are doing fairly well. But, you know, with inflation now, things have slowed down, right? People are not spending as much as they used to. But come September, I need to scale it up. Mm -hmm. So the thing with this business, is it's all invest, reinvest. So they say up to five years, it's going to be invest, reinvest. Mm -hmm. But... I feel truly blessed because, to be honest, if I didn't have this business, I wouldn't be able to cover a lot of the financial stuff that I do because I get good money from it from time to time from events or from retailers. Right. Not only that, I'm able to take the money that I make and reinvest it back in the business. So when I first started this, for example, I bought one case, which is 12 bottles. Now I bought a pallet, which is 180 cases. So I'm at a different level. I used to buy 100 labels. Now I buy 6,000 labels. You know, I used to buy 
maybe a couple hundred shrink bands. Now I buy 10,000 shrink bands. Mm. Even though I may not be selling that mass, at least now I know I had the money to invest. So it'll last me for a longer period of time. So now your investment, you put out your investment, you take from what you make. But now when you start to make more, you're, you're able to reap more of what you sow, right? And that's just the nature of the business. So I, I do uh, want to come up with my goal is to come up with a, um, a mild hot sauce. Mm. Now, I'm saying this publicly for the first time. All right. <laughs> my wife uh, took the pineapple and the mango recipe, combined the two of them, and she actually made a mild version. Now, we haven't, we haven't made a concrete yet, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take her face and mm. put it on the label of the bottle and say yeah. inspired by D Unique One, which is her nickname Yeah, for herself. So, and then I'm going to come up with a, a Scorpion Reaper and then I have a couple of other things that I want to, I want to, you know, come up with. So, Scorpion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, because you always get the, pe the people out there that just like the ghost pepper is hot, but they yeah. still want it hotter. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. So that's my goal. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to hot sauce, mm. you want to have a lineup. You want to be able to meet the criteria of those that like it mild, those that like it hot, those that like it sweet, those that like it really hot, those that like it extremely hot. So, you know, that's that's the game plan is that, again, it's time, right? When you work full time, it's hard to invest. Yeah. But, you know, I continue to pray and I'm like, God, you know, you brought me this far. I know that there's bigger, bigger plans for this. And, and I'm not being boasty about the product, but when everybody who tries it says, wow, you see their face. Yeah. Wow, bro, that's good. That's amazing. That inspires you to keep going. So you know you're on the right track mm. because people are not going to lie. They don't like it. They ain't buying it. Yeah. They don't like it. They're just going to be like, okay, thank you. And they walk away. Some people, it's too hot. You know, I admit there, there'd be somebody trying to be like, I'm like, oh man, it's too hot. You know, the person beside him be like, oh man, it's not hot enough. You know, like, you can't, you can't please everybody. Please that's everyone. the reality of it, right? But yeah. That's so, why I have a line. So, okay. So, how many flavors do you have then right now, currently? Right now, I have pineapple, mango, and ghost pepper mango. Mm. And how many stores are you in currently? I'm in oh. about 20 stores. So I'm in, uh, I'm basically, I'm in Mississauga, mm -hmm. uh, a place like Danforth Market, Nicey's, Charlie's, West Indian Grocers. I'm in Brampton, Danforth Market, a couple of other stores, Gems, West Indian Grocers. I'm in Guelph. I'm in um, Scarborough. I'm in North York. I'm in Tasty Patties up at uh, Jane and Finch there. Mm. Um, I'm at GC, I'm at GC Jerk Express, both the one in Weston and in Scarborough and Victoria Park. Mm. I'm in Whitby at Two Sisters Caribbean Grocers. I'm at, um, in our Island Market in Brampton and a few other places. Um, in Kensington, I'm at Caribbean Grocers, Caribbean Corner, sorry. Um, and a few other places. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm it's kind of spread out, mm. but to be honest with you, for this particular business, you've got to be in about, in my opinion, about 50 to 150 stores. Mm. I think once you get to 50 to 100 stores and you start to see that that, that turnover, that's when you, you can start to really consider it to be full-time. I mean, you can be in less stores and do it full-time, but it's a lot of sales. You've got yeah, to do you that. Got so you got to do farmer's market. So I'm still progressing to that where I'm trying to learn the markets in terms of like what markets are good, what districts are good, what regions are good. Um, I'm now venturing into farmer's markets, mm -hmm. you know, so that's a brand new avenue for me. Um, so I'm learning a lot. I've incorporated the business and so now it's ton up incorporated. So now, you know, you can write things off and yes. things that I never knew. Like I, I have to teach myself all these things. I didn't know about incorporations. I didn't know about HST, zero rated products, like this stuff is zero rated product. I nothing about this. So, you know, you, you have to educate yourself, right? So yeah, I, I like I'm still in the learning. You're in the learning phase and you're learning and you're growing at the same time. That's I yeah. I, I respect that. And um wh what I was gonna say, man. Um let me read this first, man. Yeah, I'm no glad problem. you're I'm glad you're sharing all this stuff with me because I wanted to know how you got the name and you said that and how the business progressed. Um right. oh, that's what I was gonna ask. Is the goal, the end goal to transition to just this and have this? Oh, 100%. And have other side things, but this is your main thing. This right? is going to be my main thing. Yeah. I want to make Ton Up Incorporated. Um, and I mean, I have a, I have the apparel too, right? TYL apparel. Yes. I don't have a lot of time to get into that, but the apparel is, stands for thank you, Lord. Now, that's a hard sell because, you know, you got to be a believer. You got to, you know, people don't focus on that, right? The main focus right. is the hot sauce. But the TYL apparel came out just briefly because I want to give thanks to God. So the TYL, is, is a way for when people wear it, like I'm wearing mine, for example, people will say, you know, what does TYL stand for? Mm. And you'll say, thank you, Lord. So it's my way of giving back. But ideally, 
my goal is is 100 i i mean i would say i heard on average for some people it takes between seven and nine years i'm hoping that i can break out at like five six mm -hmm. to be full-time if, if i if this if i continue to hustle this as of september and i really put you know put the 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 foot to the ground and move on this like i did in the beginning mm -hmm. i believe i have the potential in the next couple of years to to migrate to either full-time or a part-time job plus dedicate a lot more time to this and then merge into full-time. Right. I mean, some people are willing to take that leap of faith and, and I have to see where my spirit is and see where God is leading me, mm. but it is definitely 100%. Honestly, bro, it's nice to work for people, but it's better to work for yourself. You got you know? it, man. You know, build that legacy. Heard, yeah, build the legacy. You know, I heard it from enough time because I watch a lot of um, YouTube, but Dame Dash used to preach that before people were ready for it. And yeah. what you said about putting money back in the business, re-up, man. You got to keep you putting have that to. back. Keep putting that. You have yeah, to. I appreciate that. I just got to tell you about my friend Ashley here. She said, tell him that. Because when I did the story, she's like, oh, I just bought <laughs> some hot sauce, right? Yeah. And I can't tell you where. But yeah, Ashley yeah, yeah. said her little Jake, Jamaican, Jamaican mom approves of it because she kills the scotch bonnet. She and bought my house house? Yes, yeah, that's, yes, bro. Really? That's what I'm oh, saying, wow. man. Oh, that's blessed, man. Actually, Tell her thank you very much. Yeah, she's going to watch it. I told her to look out for it. I'm going to shout her yeah. out on the show, man. But her mom approves of it, man. Nice, nice, nice. Mm -hmm. that's okay. A blessing, man. So, you know what I want to ask you, though? We're going to wrap it up soon. I'm, I'm yeah. glad you're sharing this. Let the people know at the end where your next turn up is, um, where you're going to be, and where they could find you. But I want to ask you this because... Once in a while, I used to ask my guests if they have any words of inspiration. And you seem like someone that might have some good inspiration for someone. And I always say to someone who's about to give up on their dream or even terminate themselves, because yeah. some people are on that brink of life where they just want to end it for whatever reason, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they want to give up on their dreams and they have an aspirations. But because life gets in the way, they can't balance it. And yeah, then give up. Do you have any words of wisdom for anyone? You know, I've I've come close uh, a few times. I think twice, two or three times, I've come to a place where I wanted to take my own life, and and you know, it's it's a very very, it's it's a challenging situation to be in, but you know, you have to trust and believe in God and know that there's a reason. We're all placed on this earth for a reason. No matter what, no matter how low things may get. Everything in life is for a reason. And and you just have to have that faith and just know that our place on this earth is for a reason. You know, sometimes even just saying hello to somebody can make their day. Put a smile on somebody's face. You know, to give in is to give up. And and one thing is that, and, and even with this business, I've thought many a times, I just want to throw in a towel. You know, you, you make a batch and it just too, like, like a whole five gallons thrown out. That's money. But if I had given up, I wouldn't be where I am today. If I had given up on life and all the trials and tribulations that I had, I've gone through, I wouldn't be here to educate people today. The only legend that would, would exist would be, that was that guy that did this. That was that guy that did that. You know, he had a negative impact. But now I've turned my life around and I've been able to revert to a more positive way of thinking and as a result i can tell people hey i've been there i may not have been in your exact same situation but i know what low is i, I i've been in places where i had to go to food banks i've lived on the street i've been in and out of jail you know i've i've never done hardcore drugs so there's some things that i can't relate to but our reality is our reality so what my reality is and, and trials and tribulations that i've gone through have impacted me in such a way that it may be equal to yours, but just on a different level. Maybe yours was drugs. Maybe mine was alcohol. Maybe mine was jail, but never give up. You know, God has, uh, you know, a, an intention for all of us and anything that you do that is negative can be turned into a positive. No matter what you're going through in your life, you can turn it around. The only way you can't turn it around is to take your life. There's no second chances. Once you've taken your life, and, and, and technically, that's not our job. That's God's job. You know, we are not the makers of ourselves. So who then gives us the authority to take our own lives? 
We have to give God the blessings and the praise for the gift of life that's given to us each and every day. So try to find a positive even in a negative situation, because I can tell you from my own self, everything to me back in the day was negative. Everything I did, you couldn't tell me nothing. If you told me the sky was blue, I'm like, no, nah, I'm in the sky black. You know, I, I'd be so pissed off. I'd be so negative about everything. But now I try to find a positive in every circumstance. You know, you could get into an accident and survive. And you may take it as a negative, but you could have gotten something else and died. You know, so just don't give up. If I, if I can inspire anybody to do anything Trust and believe in God. There's things that I haven't told you in this podcast that I've been in places where I was on my knees, where I thought there was nothing else left in the world because everything had been taken away from me. And then I said to myself, God brought me here for a reason. God brought me here so that I could praise him, so that I could give glory to him. And I came out of that deep, dark hole. You know, and maybe I'll tell you one time, like after the podcast, not something I want to broadcast now, but I was in a deep, deep, dark place. I mean, literally in a room where everything that I, everything that was, that was what I thought was, was good had been taken away from me. And I overcame that. And here I am today. And it's taught me so much. I used to say to God, why, you know, why are you doing this to me? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? But then when I looked at it, I said, you know what? Now I know why you had to bring me here so that I could see the light so that I could change who I was as a person. Because if I had to continue down this path, the end result wouldn't have been good. So I took that negative and reverted it. And I saw the light. And after seeing the light, I realized that that's not where I want to go. And I had to bring myself out of that through tears, through begging, through, through like, listening to music to go to sleep like you know the spiritual music it, it was rough bro it was really really rough so nothing is impossible with god truth be told nothing is impossible with god so keep the faith keep on living because there's a reason why we're on this earth so just keep on living and keep positive mm. thank you manuel for sharing that brother manuel the last thing we're gonna do um is you're gonna choose before we do the donation you're gonna choose um which card you want me to read out and you're gonna answer it so do you choose the blue jays or do you choose the raptors the raptors mm. of course it's gonna be interesting <laughs> you shared a lot i wonder what you're gonna say what is one of the most memorable moments of your life And one of the most memorable moments of my life, you know what? I, I have to speak of, of getting married to my wife. You know, it's marrying my wife was more, was one of the most glorified moments ever, you know, seeing her walk down that aisle, seeing the, the white gown, we sang to each other. You know, we were, we were in a, it was a very small wedding. We had two mics and we had a song that was dedicated and we were singing to each other as we walked towards the, uh, you know, towards like she walked towards me. And it was it was such it was such a like I cried. You know what I mean? It was given everything in my past to know that a woman has embraced me and accepted me for everything that I was, is and about to become. You know, that's for me, that's one of the most cherishable moments ever. Because it's life changing, you know. Marriage is for life through thick or thin, through through better or for worse. So I give God the glory, the praise, and I and I bless God for my wife because you know it, it's it's just it's it's amazing. You know, it's it, nothing can take away from that moment, and you get to revisit that moment as every year passes, and you get to see life with that person, that that spouse. And you get to cherish that moment. You get to relive that every anniversary. In fact, we got married on our birthday. So oh. not only am I cherishing <laughs> and honoring our anniversary, but yeah. I'm also honoring and cherishing her birthday, which was a very special thing for her because she chose to get married on her birthday. And that's big because yeah. most people want to keep their birthday celebration different from their anniversary. But she said, no, I want to marry you on my birthday. So I will never, ever forget that. Oops, sorry. I thought this thing was turned down. I guess not. Sorry about that. No worries. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, that's, that's, that's what it is. That's, um, I'm going to turn this off. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's one of the most, that, that is the most cherishable. Moment. I was giving my life to God, mm -hmm. but when I gave my life to God, I was, I was in jail and, you know, mm -hmm. I, 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 I 
gave my life to God, you know, came, you know, backslid, gave my life back to God, you know, so it's, it's been ongoing, right? Yeah. So it's a journey. It's a journey. It is definitely a journey. It's, it's, it's challenging. Okay. Yo, this is an amazing podcast. We're going to do the donation. But first, before I do, let the people know where they could find you. I'm glad you told me about the hot sauce. I'm going to get my own hot sauce. <laughs> yes. And um, that's the journey that's, that keeps on going. So I know that's your end goal to just yes. do that. And um, I'm praying for you, bro. Thank you, man. Um, I appreciate it. Yes, anytime, man. And I'm going to support you any way I can, too. Um, but let the people know what you coming up have coming up. And because if they're in the city, you know, people can yeah, yeah. visit anywhere in GTA. Go ahead. All right. So I'll start off with my website. So my website is www.tonuphotsauce.com. That's T-U-N-U-P hotsauce.com. Uh, the next event I'm going to be at is uh, with Peace of Healing Markets at uh, in Ajax. I believe it's 109 Pickering Road. The next event will not be until September, which will be at Mimico Square. I believe it's on the 9th. But if you follow me on IG at Ton of Hot Sauce, all of my events are posted there. Um, in terms of where to purchase it in retail, uh, I'll just give you a few of the prime locations. Danforth Food Market, Nicey's, and Charlie's West Indian Grocers in um, Mississauga. Danforth Food Market, as well as Gems West Indian Grocers in Brampton and a &R Island Market. Uh, you can get it in Scarborough at GC Jerk Express um, Restaurant, as well as Western Road. Tasty Patties up in Jane and Finch. Delight Food at Jane and Shoreham. And the Two Sisters Caribbean out in Whitby. Those are the prime locations. Feel free to hit them up or even go on to my website, click on the store locator, and it will give you all of the regions, all locations, and a map on how to get there. Or you can always hit me up. My phone number is 647-713-7685. Send me a text. Send me a WhatsApp. I'm in the Mississauga region. We can always link up, and I gladly provide you in person. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Now... We got the donations to do now. We got the balloons going on. Yes. So, for season seven, I'm donating to Claws, Kawartha Lakes Animal Wellness Society, the nice. fundraiser warriors, four little boys, you know, raising funds for a lot of things. A lot, it's sick, sick Kids Hospital is one of the big ones. And uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation. So, oh, nice. by your choice, I'm going to see which one I'll pop and who I'm donating to. The left, the middle, or my right. I'm going to say the middle. The middle. <laughs> <laughs> season seven. This is the last episode for season seven, by the way. You're, you're podcast number 11. So nice. Eight's coming. Last episode of season, season seven with Emmanuel. Seven is oh, my lucky number. It's my birthday, August 7th. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, my grandmother, who passed at 106. Wow. Yeah, she was August, August wow, that's a Good life, though. Yeah, nice long life. Good life, good this, life. This one's being cho chosen a lot. I don't know if you're going to see it when I pull it away. Maybe not, but it's Make-A-Wish uh, Make Wish Foundation. Nice. Sweet. All right, Emmanuel, thank you for coming out. This has been a great experience for myself, and I hope you sharing your story helped as well. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's been a blessing and I appreciate you giving me the time and, um, you know, being able to express myself and things will come to know things about me that people will come to know things about me they never knew before. And and, and that's OK. That's good. Mm. Just keep yes. it positive. Keep it keep it high spirited, you know, and just bless God and everything, my friend. There you go. Season seven. Real talk with Star Scorpio. And we out. <laughs>